Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our public forum tonight. We welcome those of you that are present with us, but we also welcome, I understand, about 70 people who are online. So um, we welcome you as well, and we'll try to remember to keep looking at that blue light at the back so that we're focusing on the wider audience. So thank you to all of you for making time to be part of this wonderful event tonight, uh, Funding, Equity and Achievement in Australian Schools. For those of you I haven't met, my name is Jim Waterston and I'm the Dean of the Melbourne Graduate School of Education and have been for over five years. So I'm very privileged to be able to host these events and this one is um, one of our best. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the unceded land upon which we meet tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging and welcome Indigenous people who are with us tonight. As we focus today on strategies to improve our educational outcomes for all, I recognise our First Nations people as our first teachers who have sustained this land for over 60,000 years. Without any further ado, I do want to just let most of you know, because uh, you weren't there today, we, we did have a forum, uh, a symposium I think we called it, Funding, Equity and Achievement in Australian Schools, very similar title to tonight. And we had about 70 invited participants, many of whom are here today, and we worked through three cycles of, of uh, ideas around um, improving the funding for schools and then of course improving um, outcomes with that funding and what we can do about, uh, about that. And so this is all part of a, a process as we move forward and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But this public forum um, is on school funding, equity and achievement as I said at the beginning. And as we now have a, a, a equity sensitive minister for education at the national level, which is a great thing. The Honourable Jason Clare has recently established an expert panel of which one of those members is a member of the Melbourne Graduate School of <laughs> Education uh, faculty um, and has uh, to advise ministers around Australia about the next national school, form uh, school reform agreement. This panel will report by October 2023. So part of what we're talking about tonight and part of what we spent the day considering is um, advice and perhaps any recommendations we would have as a group to, to that uh, group to think about um, what this National School Reform Agreement will look like going into 2024. Over the next few months, serious debates about the future of school education in Australia will and must occur. With its focus on funding, equity and achievement, tonight's discussions will contribute to these debates and will help inform imminent changes to the National School Reform Agreement. Tonight we welcome three key stakeholders and leading educational researchers and policy analysts. Professor Barry McGaw, the Honourable Professor Verity Firth and the Honourable Dr Carmen Lawrence. Welcome along to all three of you. Oh yes, of course. You are honourable. <laughs> we'll be inviting each of them to have their say and okay, I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce our first speaker. We just had a little discussion about the process. I was going to read the bios of all three presenters but uh, it would take a long time and I think it would be much better for me to do that as each speaker um, comes to the lectern. So our first speaker tonight is Professor Barry McGaw, as I said earlier. Barry is an Emeritus Professor of Murdoch University in Perth and an Honorary Professional Fellow in the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. A much loved professional fellow, can I say. <laughs> Professor McGaw's career began as a science teacher in Queensland, leading to the position of Head of Research and, and Curriculum Branch at the Department of Education in Queensland and Following this, Professor of Education at Murdoch University, where he chaired a review of tertiary education entrance procedures. He was later appointed as Executive Director of the Australian Council for Education Research, known to most of us as ACR, in Melbourne and then Director of, uh, for Education at the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, in Paris. While at ACER, Professor McGaw chaired a review of upper secondary assessment in the ACT and conducted a review of the curriculum and assessment at, in the New South Wales Higher School Certificate. After returning to Australia from the OECD, Professor McGaw served as a Foundation Chair of the Board of the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority, better known as ACARA, and in 1920-21 chaired the most recent review of the National Assessment, Progr National Assessment Program, Literacy and Numeracy, also better known as NAPLAN. It is evident that Professor McGaw has had an extensive involvement in education policy and development. And before I welcome him, I'd also like to say over the last two decades, I've interacted with Barry in lots of different ways, in different roles that I've had, and he's been an amazing influence on me and my thinking about education and development. And I can, I'm saying that 
on behalf of the profession right across Australia. So thank you for all you have done, Barry, and continue to do. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite you to the lecture. Thanks, Barry. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. I almost feel I need to apologise to those who've been at the symposium. I'm the only repeat performance from <laughs> today and tonight, and I don't have another way of saying the same thing I said this morning. So um, my task is to set the context, actually, for a discussion about issues of... Um, well, the, the title of the event is Funding, Equity and Achievement. I'm going to do it in the other order. Looking first at issues of achievement, what we know, and I'm going to draw on the, the work that we did at the OECD, and, and which has been done since I left there, to give you this illustration. These are the results that we got in 2000 from the first application of the Program for International Student Assessment, PISA. Um, every country that participated is shown there as a box, with a line in the middle of the box indicating the mean performance of the sample of 15-year-olds who participated. And the size of the box around the mean indicates where the population value for the average would be. So the, the sample gives you just an estimate. Some countries have bigger boxes than others because their samples were less precise than others. They didn't choose their own samples. There was no way they could manipulate the data. The OECD project conducted the, the sampling, both of the schools that were in the study and of students within the schools. Now, there's Australia. We did extremely well. We felt very proud of that. I mean, I'd just arrived at OECD the year before this uh, survey was undertaken. The, the whole project was led by the Australian Council for Education Research, actually. Um, and all those countries whose boxes overlap with Australia's are not significantly different from Australia. So you could say, there's a batch that are just like us, really. New Zealand minister, who noticed he was just one ahead of Australia, announced that they'd beaten us in, in rugby and, and now in reading. Um, that's a non-significant difference. And the way I always presented our result was to say, well, we tied for second. The only country ahead of us was Finland. And Finland was ahead of us only in reading, not in maths or science. The ones ahead of us in maths and science were Japan and Korea, but uh, not, in, not Finland. Well, what's happened since then? I just take some of the countries that were amongst, like us, among the high performers in the, on the first occasion. Now, the OECD average has declined. Now, in, with modern psychometrics, we, we're not doing normative testing where you can only understand how someone's performed in comparison with others, or with the average of others, the norm, the old norm reference test. We now have standards reference tests there is a scale on which you can map the performance, and if the performance of the OECD countries were to improve, you would see the OECD rising up the scale or decline. You'd see it going down the scale. Now, there may be a normative component to that because the number of countries in the OECD has increased since the first assessment, um, and some of the countries that have joined performed below the mean, so that would pull the mean down to some extent. But what's more interesting is, independent of the OECD mean, what's happened to the countries? Well, here's Finland. Everyone rushed to Finland when we showed they were top of the pops in 2000, and everyone went with a pocket full of pet preferences, and they cherry-picked the Finnish data until they found things they <laughs> liked about Finland that they wished we did in Australia, and said, that is why they're good. And if we did that, we would match them. Now, in fact, uh, Tim Oates from the Cambridge, Oxford and Cambridge Assessment Unit, the head of research, has done a very interesting study of Finland before 2000, saying what made Finland where it was in 2000 was not what Finland was doing in 2000, but what it did beforehand in the 90s, the 80s even, when they had set textbooks for schools, had inspectors visiting schools. They didn't have the wonderful system that everybody's been describing since then. And I'm inclined these days to say, Passy Salberg doesn't like this, but mm -hmm. what we saw when we went to Finland in 2000 was the seeds of the decline that was to follow, <laughs> rather than the cause of the the current performance. Canada declined a bit. Australia declined even more. And interestingly, Poland. 
significantly way below the OECD average in 2000. And the reason I've picked 9 and 18 is while PISA is done every three years, the main domain of reading was tested in 1000, 2009, 2018 on a nine-year cycle. We'll have a math cycle um, next. That would have been out later last, late last year, but because of COVID, it'll come out late this year. And I think we'll, we'll look worse in maths than we did in, we did in the reading assessments over that period. So what did Poland do? One of the problems with these international data, is, or any data, you look at just correlational evidence. Oh, this is what the performance is, and these are the things we can see in the system. What do we attribute the performance to? Well, you can't do randomised control studies in a case like this, but you can, in this case with Poland, get a very strong interrupted time series. We know what they were doing in 2000. We know what they changed between 2000 and 2003, actually. And Poland was the only country that got better on every measure between 2000 and 2003. I used to talk about that and wonder, could they sustain it? Well, they've more than sustained it. They're now not different from... Um, significantly different from Finland. They're significantly ahead of us and the OECD mean, having been significantly behind us. Well, what did they do? Let's look at the difference between schools as one way of thinking about equity. We petitioned the variation among students into variation among students within schools, but also, interestingly, and more importantly for this talk tonight, into variation in performance of students between schools. Now look at the schools at the left-hand end of that graph. Belgium, Germany, Hungary, Austria, Poland. These are countries that at the beginning of secondary school stream students into schools of different kinds based on their performance at primary school. So the high performers are in select schools, the low performers are in select schools. They're all select schools. They're select schools designed to give you the company of people like yourself. Now you can see here, there's Australia. We're in the middle. We don't systematically make schools different like those European countries do, um, but we do it in other ways with a public private system, with demographic differences in the school environments, school uh, clientele, and so on. There's Canada, and there's Finland. All the countries around Finland apart from Spain, actually, are Scandinavian countries, where there's almost no difference between the schools. All the difference occurs within the schools. So if you're a parent, it doesn't matter much what school you send your child to. And there's Poland, as I described, making active streaming of students into schools of different kinds. Three years later, there's Australia, Canada and Finland, as before, pretty much. And here's Poland now. Looks like the Scandinavian countries. The change they made was they stopped selecting students into different kinds of high schools and they made their secondary schools entirely comprehensive. And that shows they did it. They now have almost no difference between their schools. But at the same time, they raised the achievement of their students. So the notion that you've got, you've got to give students company like themselves to deal well with them um, is denied by those data. And also, interestingly, further by some analysis that was done in a study in Austria where they showed that if you petition, as we did for some of our other analyses, the between school difference into how much of it you could explain in terms of the social background of the students and how much you could explain in terms of the social background of the other students. That is, you're measuring the student's own background and you're measuring the company they keep. And when those results came out, it showed that there was a strong effect for both. And I thought from a policy perspective, that's really unsatisfying because if, if there is a benefit from company and you want to suggest a more comprehensive arrangement of schools, you'll be trying to win an argument against people who will think they will lose privilege. But the Austrian research showed that the effect is not uniform. There is almost no benefit for students of high ability to be amongst others of their ability. There is a huge disadvantage for students of low performance, not ability, low achievement, to be among other students of low achievement. So 
if you made the schools comprehensive in the way Poland did, you're not going to affect the high performers, you are going to potentially affect the low performers. And that's what they did, as I'm about to show you. In the uh, reading test, uh, we, we defined levels, levels of proficiency. There's very detailed definitions of what it means to be able to read at the highest level. But look at the proportions. There is Finland, Canada, Australia and Poland. Finland and Canada with quite high proportions of high performing students and Australia with a reasonably high performance in the dark, blue, dark green at the top. But look at the red at the bottom. Um, Poland with very few of the high performers in the dark green and very many low performers in the red. Now if you track this each year, each PISA cycle to 2003, 6 and then to 9, you'd see that the first thing they did was to pull up the tail with their new comprehensive schools. And then they shifted the whole distribution. But I'll take you right through to 2018 and see, look what's happened. Australia's got an even longer tail. It's the third one in, Finland, Canada, Australia, in the dark red than it had before, whereas Poland now looks just like Finland and Canada in pulling up the tail by making their schools comprehensive. And look, um, and you can see the, the shift in that distribution up through the different levels, which underpin the shift, in sin, the shift in means I showed you before. Now I want to come to the question of funding. The others will talk about this in more detail, but first of all, what can we say about differences in the impact of socioeconomic status on achievement? That's the quarter of a million 15-year-olds in the first PISA study, represented by those dots. And that's the regression line for the OECD. Now, the, the steeper the line, the less equitable the results. A steep line indicates as you move across from less advantage, more advantage to less advantage, left to right, the average performance of the students involved rises up the achievement scale. So that's in reading literacy. Now, a, a less steep line would, be more, would indicate more equitable distribution of achievements and a steeper line less equitable. Now those, um, unfortunately, have shifted up in the transfer from Mac to Windows, <laughs> but, but you can see the difference. The, uh, the brown line for Germany was well below the OECD line and created quite a shock. But you need not look at that. I've got another way to show you those data without putting a line on for every country. So that shows where all the countries lie. The vertical axis is reading performance on PISA, the horizontal axis is how different is the slope from the OECD average? Just subtract the, the um, country's slope from the OECD average. If the country's slope is less steep, the answer is positive. If it's more steep, the answer is negative. So I divide that into four quadrants. If a country is to the right of the vertical red line, the, its slope is less steep than the OECD average one. If the country's name is in blue, it's significantly less steep. To the left, if the country's name is in red, it's significantly steeper than the OECD and thus even less equitable than the OECD as a whole. And you can see Australia up in that top corner on the left. So we could label that corner up there. Those are the countries that have achieved both equity and quality at the same time. So much debate in Australia I'd participated in before I went to the OECD assumed that if you pursued issues, concerns about equity, you'd have to give up on quality. And these data, way back then, helped us change that conversation because of the countries that can achieve both at the same time, including one that we would think more like us than any other, Canada. So we're in a, that quadrant that you'd call high quality but low equity. Uh, that's better than being in either of the other two, low quality and high equity or even low quality and low equity. Well, what's happened since the first? And I thought this might be one way to look at it. The, the, where I've outlined the country's name in yellow, that was their 2000 result, the slope of their line. Where it's in teal colour, that was 2009, and where it's in the tan colour, 2018. Look at Canada, always up in the top quadrant. Look at Finland. It's moved by 2018 down to the high quality, low equity. So it's the poster child that the ABC keeps talking about, but it's not really the poster child. Um, 
And look at Australia. We've, we've remained over in that left quadrant, though in the most recent data, 2018, uh, we are not significantly below the OECD average. But there are more countries defining that average now, of course. Now, differences in funding levels. I don't want to speak about this in a lot of detail. I'll just make this point. I, I picked out, just to illustrate, and not at random, I have to say, two schools. One's a high-status, non-government school with students from kindergarten to year 12, P to 12. And the other's a government's secondary school with students 7 to 12. And that just shows the kind of data on expenditure that's on the My School website. Now, look at the top right-hand corner. That non-government school got $28 million over the five years from the federal government, and this government school got $25 million from the federal government. But you can see, if you look a bit further down, that fees generated nearly $300 million for the independent school, and the, whereas the state government gave the government school only $100,000. Million, only 100, but what I think is extremely interesting is this figure. All the money that the, the school had from the Australian government, the state government, fees and charges and other private sources produced a total from which they were able to remove $32 million and put it in their capital fund to build or refurbish school buildings. And that was more than the federal government gave them. So the federal government is giving these high status schools money for capital works and so much money for recurrent expenditure that they could move more than the feds had given them out for further uh, provision of capital equipment. I think that's a, a really interesting question about inequity really that's not often enough I think talked about. And if you express the results of those schools, because they're different size schools, and try to understand not just how much they had but what did that mean per student? Look at those results. That non-government school had, in 2021, $33,000 per student, even after moving those funds out to capital, whereas the government school had only 15000 And the government school's only secondary, which is more expensive. The non-government school's got a primary cohort, which is less expensive. So it's a very stark comparison. Now, there are some other funding models. We heard a lot of detail about these today. I just do give you two examples. In the Netherlands, about 70% of students go to non-government schools. Faith-based schools, Islamic, Christian of various kinds, and so on, or community schools, and the remainder go to national schools. They are all fully funded by the government and may not charge fees. They are all fully funded at the same level. Go to Canada, to Alberta. I like Alberta because I had a friend who did his doctorate in Alberta and ended up being deputy superintendent of the largest school district in Calgary. And there, when you paid your tax, you said where the education component of your tax should go. Should it go to the government school system or the Catholic school system? So it, it followed where you said it should go. Then from those funds, all schools were funded on the same basis, according to their size. And he said he had to deal with some interesting stories. People who'd said, oh, my, I'm Catholic, my taxes should go to the Catholic school system. When their kids got to school, they thought, oh, the, the other school's better than the Catholic school. So they would front up at his office and say, oh, I've had a crisis of faith, really. <laughs> <laughs> and I need to, my, my child needs to go to the government, the public school, not the Catholic school. And he'd have others come in who live somewhere else and uh, felt the other way around and said, oh, look, I've come to faith. <laughs> and I, I need my child to go not where my taxes went, but where I now need my child to go. So he was probably a bit like Solomon by the time he dealt with all of these. <laughs> so I, we're not going, we had a lot of people today telling us we could adopt one of those systems. New, New Zealand's done it, others have done it. But we've got one other model that we didn't talk about today, which is collaborating schools. In, in uh, Golden Grove in South Australia, re replicated in some other places, including Carolyn and Springs in Victoria, where in, in, in Golden Grove, every primary school site has two schools on it. One government, one non-government. In one case, they share only the ovals. In another case, the staff share common staff rooms. And the high school site is a single site with three schools on it. School students wear different uniforms, badges recognised, 
schools follow their own ethos. There's a Catholic school, there's a Anglican, Joint Anglican Uniting School, and there's a government school. And between them, they've got very expensive library facilities, better science facilities than any of the schools could have provided alone, a CAD CAM facility for design work, and the schools collaborate in the use and take it year about to do the timetabling of the shared facilities. Now that's a, an interesting model that's been taken up a little across Australia, but not much. The state government, by and large, didn't pursue it, but um, I think it's a very interesting model. So there we are. Our quality is declining. Our inequity is high and staying so. Our funding levels vary greatly. And I think, by and large, there's a strong resistance to reform in Australia, mostly because mm. the reform is seen to threaten the privileged and they're in a powerful position to resist reform. Mm. There was a debate going on here once about when, whether Melbourne Grammar should go co-ed. <laughs> Principal lost his job and went to work in America as a consequence. <laughs> But one father wrote a letter to The Age, on, it was published on a Saturday morning, in which he said, I do not send my sons to this school for the three R's. I send them for the three C's. Culture, connections and cachet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Very good. There's a bit more than before. Thank you, Barry. That was a great introduction. And, um, uh, made me think back that I loved seeing Finland at the top of uh, the PISA results. I had changed jobs three times in the early 2000s and when I was in the ACT they sent me to Finland and then when I moved to uh, the Victorian Department of Education they, moved, they sent me to Finland and then when I went to Queensland they sent me to fin Finland. So, so I was pretty disappointed when Finland dropped a bit further because I didn't get, to, I didn't get sent there from this job but I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> Our second presenter tonight um, is the Honourable Professor Verity Firth AM, Pro Vice-Chancellor, Social Justice and Inclusion at the University of Technology in Sydney. Professor Firth leads the Centre for Social Justice and Inclusion, aimed at, in ch aimed at channeling, channeling the university's resources to remove barriers to education, empower, empower communities, increase diversity and inclusion and advocate for social justice. She led the implementation of the University of Technology Sydney Social Impact Framework, a first of its kind in the, for the Australian university sector. Starting her career as a lawyer and serving as a Deputy Lord Mayor of the City of Sydney, Professor Firth has since gained over 15 years experience at the very highest levels of government and the not-for-profit sector in Australia. She served as a Minister for Education and Training in New South Wales in 2008 to 11 and then as Chief Executive of the Public Education Foundation. As Minister for Education and Training, Professor Firth focused on equity in education and how to best address educational disadvantage in low socioeconomic communities, including rural and remote Indigenous communities. Professor Firth also served as a New South Wales Minister for Women from 2007 to 2009, implementing sector-wide strategies to improve women's recruitment, development and employment in the New South Wales public sector. She led the Public Education Foundation 2011 to 14 as Chief Executive, transforming it from a fledgling, <laughs> fledgling organisation into a major provider of scholarships and support to public education. Professor Firth has also helped the sector negotiate $5 million in seed funding for a new charity for disadvantaged schools and was the member for the state seat of Belmain from 2007 to 2011. We appreciate her, participant, uh, her participation and valuable insight in tonight's forum. Thank you, Verity. Thank you very much. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we are meeting tonight. This thing we've got to remember about the Australian education system is that it is an outlier. It is an outlier in global terms. 34.6% of our students go to non-government schools, 65.4% go to government schools. The average for the OECD is 18% going to non-government schools. In the US, only 8% go to non-government schools. In Canada, it's 6%. Yet in Australia, we're at 346 Every January for the last 20 years, 10% of Year 6 students have left the government system to attend non-government schools in Australia. Australia has above average levels of school resources overall, but the fifth largest resource gap between advantaged and disadvantaged schools. 
And one of the big issues that Australian education system therefore faces, as Barry has pointed out, is increasing segregation of its schooling, largely along lines of class, academic capability, race and religion. This segregation, as Barry has shown, impacts negatively on Australia's education performance. And the reason it does so is because quality and equity are not competing goals. Equitable systems drive quality education outcomes, as well as a whole other range of other social and economic benefits. At the heart of the school funding debate in this country are different political views about how you drive education quality. And I call them political views because they really are political views. A lot of these views are not driven by any research or evidence in relation to what works in education. The conservative side of politics argues that quality education is delivered through parental choice and competition. The reason for the federal government to fund non-government schools the way they do is that public subsidy supports choice for parents and lessens pressure on the public purse to provide education for all. The progressive side of politics argues that quality education is driven through cooperation, reciprocity and resource equity among schools. Inequality in education outcomes amongst different social groups are not the result of innate talent or lack of innate talent. They are the result of structural socio-economic disadvantage. These gaps in achievement therefore must be addressed through improvements to the system. Increased funding linked to the evidence of what works, mixed cohorts at school, as Barry so um, clearly pointed out, great teaching and learning, and engage parents and communities. So how are we where we are and what can we do about it? There are really interesting historical reasons about why we are where we are, including the fact that education of working class kids in 19th century Australia was predominantly taken up by Catholic parishes before the Protestants realised to their horror that the Catholics were educating the working class and we needed to do something about it. And so in 1880, um, in New South Wales at least, they established free secular public education for all. And even with, I always like to remind audiences of this, even with the establishment of public education in, in New South Wales, it was still pretty Anglican, it was still pretty Protestant in focus. School funding, therefore, has been a difficult political issue in Australia. Both Labor and the LNP have had constituencies within their own parties arguing for state aid for non-government schools. The Labor Party, in, from the 1960s onward, or in fact, you could argue even from the 1950s with the split in the Labor Party um, to the DLP, they needed to appeal to their Catholic working class base and through the provision of state aid sought to ensure the survival of the Catholic system. The coalition, as the party traditionally of both Protestantism and capitalism, has long seen public schools as a social safety net rather than as a primary mechanism for social uplift. During the Howard years, Commonwealth funding for schools almost doubled in real terms and almost three quarters of that growth was directed to schools in the non-government sector. Parental choice was everything. And as I was rereading to research for this speech to remind myself, I just look at those Howard years as the biggest waste and the biggest impact on our education. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's also a really weird, and this was pointed out at the symposium today, it's a weird anomaly in our funding system that despite the fact that the Commonwealth does not own or operate schools and only funds around a third of the total public spend, it has been the driving force in Australian school policy for the last 50 years. And in many ways, its interventions have transformed the face of Australian schooling. And that is something to think about as we enter this next round. So Labor comes to power in 2007. Julian Gillard is Education Minister and she institutes the Gonski Review. Admittedly, not till 2010. But when she announced the review, she also made it clear that there would be no losers in the process. <laughs> Rightly or wrongly, Labor have long felt a little freaked out by the perceived electoral power of the non-government schools. In her 1999 autobiography, Susan Ryan um, writes about her time as Minister for Education and Youth Affairs in the Hawke government. And I love this... Um, quote, because if you've been a politician, it just makes you laugh. And probably even if you haven't been a politician, it makes you laugh. 
In pursuit of necessary savings and fairness, my first budget implemented in a moderate form a pre-election commitment to reduce the level of funds flowing to the, those private schools that were, by anyone's standard, well off. After a great deal of agonising and endless consultation with and by the Schools Commission, I developed a formula. It left 41 schools exposed to minor reductions. None of these careful, rigorous and honest preparations, nor the evident financial well-being of the 41 schools, mitigated the outrage that erupted when I announced the decision. <coughs> Thousands of enraged, well-heeled parents attended rowdy rallies. New rhetoric implied that the 41 schools mainly enrolled the students of single mothers who scrubbed floors and worked nights to pay the fees. No vilification of the minister was deemed excessive. In Melbourne, I exposed myself to a few thousand of them in the Malvern Town Hall, where they hissed, booed, spat, and generally expressed their criticisms of our policies in ways that detracted somewhat from their alleged concern for higher standards. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan had to back down on her reforms. And what's, I think, been a real pity in terms of within Labor circles is some of those lessons were held tightly by the Labor Party. The backing down of the Susan Ryan's reforms, the hit list, and also the Mark Latham election, which again, the more conservative elements, both outside and within the party, argue that it was his radical agenda on schools that meant that Labor lost the election. I would argue that there were other issues. <laughs> um, the Gonski Review was important in the history of Australian school funding, as it was a prag at the time it was a pragmatic recognition of the complexity of the Australian education system and its hybrid nature. The Gonski Review, in essence, acknowledged the fact that the horse had at least at that stage bolted politically in relation to the government provision of recurrent funding for non-government schools. And recognising this political impasse, the Review stripped away the public versus private debate, declared itself to be sector blind, which we discussed a bit today, and went straight to student need setting an objective schooling resource standard and recognising the additional cost for schools educating high concentrations of equity cohorts through equity loading, loadings. The review panel recommended investing as early as possible in high quality education for all students and directing additional resources toward the most disadvantaged students, arguing that this is a cost effective strategy that will have the greatest impact on improving overall performance in the Australian school system. In the early stages of the Gonski Review, I was still Education Minister. I was in New South Wales and there was considerable momentum for reform. I'm sure there were other people who were working in education at the time. All of the peak bodies initially were in favour of the sector blind approach and they came out with really strong statements of support. It was also really hard for them to argue against the logic of needs based funding. How on earth do you actually mount an argument against need? And two of the panellists of the board were members of elite private school boards and they really did appear to have had genuine road to Damascus style conversions as they'd gone round and seen the condition of um, public schooling in this country. And they were work working hard to change the system. However, once the panel's recommendations were actually delivered up to government, implementation then had to occur. And as we, we know the history, and in fact it's a bit PTSD to go through the history, <laughs> but let's go through it anyway. Julia Gillard's no losers policy of course meant from the outset that the formula was skewed to maintaining existing entitlement for some schools, adding consider considerably to the cost of the scheme. The model also relied on state cooperation as Gonski rather ambitiously rewrote federal state education funding relations. Although the federal government was prepared to fund 65% of the increase in funding needed to bring all the schools up to the school's resource standard, this still required state governments to fund the other 35%, which for state government budgets is a big ask. And last but not least, despite the early momentum of the Gonski Review, the federal government's political capital was waning. And I can speak personally to what it's like when your political capital starts to wane. I was talking actually with Carmen before, I was in, you know, I was in the tail end of an extremely unpopular government. And when you have no political capital, or at least waning political capital, it is very hard to get anything done. It's hard, you don't have power. It's hard to negotiate with those that are recalcitrant. 
And because Labor had loaded the majority of the new spend in years five and six of their funding commitment, if people can remember that, it meant that the coalition could come out and say, we match Labor's deal. But of course, they weren't really matching Labor's deal. They were just matching the Labor's deal in the context of the forward estimates. Conservative state governments in Queensland, Western Australia and Northern Territory read the breeze and were recalcitrant to sign, so didn't sign up to bilateral agreements. And of, and of course, the non-government sector started to realise there might be something a bit rosier over the horizon and also played, um, I don't know, I won't say played games, but you know what I mean, weren't, weren't at the table in the way they had been before. After Liberals won the 2013 election, the recalcitrant states did sign up to the agreement but these negotiations, as with the other states, were behind closed doors. And what we now know, and is evident by the current bilateral agreements, is that to this day these agreements remain deeply inconsistent and inequitable. Currently, most private schools are funded at 100% of the recommended amount um, under the school resourcing standard, whereas government schools still fall short in every state. Most states and territories are on a transition path, but at the moment it looks like they're still only going to reach around 91% of combined funding. And although, although Jason Clare has, of course, established this new process and, at their, and they have said on the record that they are committed to fixing the situation and working with state and territory governments, the big question for the current Labor government is whether it will tackle the deeper structural reforms necessary to stop um, segregation and declining education outcomes in Australian education. A couple of years ago, I was in public conversation with this academic called Mayra Levinson, who's an education ethicist from Harvard, who told me somewhat bleakly that no matter what funding or organisational system you devise, you cannot stop elite capture. Her view was that parents with social, cultural and economic capital will always be able to capture public resources for their needs. In the US, they don't have a large non-government system, but they do have a massive resource differences between schools and strict school boundaries segregate the local population along class and race lines. Many of our speakers today at the symposium talked, in essence, about elite capture and how difficult the political environment is for governments who seek fundamental change to education funding in this country. Given the state of the federal budget and the hard choices that will need to be made, I'd like to think that this government will not just throw up their hands and succumb to inevitable elite capture. Governments have a responsibility to spend public funds wisely. In Australia, the government subsidy of non-government schools underwrites the cost of teachers for those schools. School fees and other sources of income can be spent on other things, again, as pointed out in Barry's slides. When Rebecca Huntley and I undertook some research in 2014 into the reasons that parents gave about why they sent their children to non-government schools over government schools, over 50% of respondents said that they chose a non-government high school over their local high school because it had better facilities, better drama rooms, better playing fields, better science labs. None of it. It was really interesting how few people actually talked about education outcomes. Public funding for a facilities arms race in which public schools can't afford to compete. Australian governments fund non-government schools to set up in local areas in direct competition with government schools. They fund multiple schools in a geographic location, all of whom are competing with each other for students, leaving some students with no choice but the school with the fewer students and the least resources. Is there any other area of public policy where the government funds its competitor and in so doing reduces its own institution's capacity to perform and makes the task of performance more expensive? The Gonski Review sought to solve this problem through the establishment of a school growth fund that would only fund schools where they were needed, but it was never implemented. Government investment in Australia comes with far fewer strings than government school funding in other countries. There is no international equivalent to the situation in Australia where non-government schools are provided with both public funding and uncapped fees. There is no requirement on non-government schools in Australia to increase access or admit local students as a basis of receiving government funding. Nowhere in the world does public funding come with so few public obligations. Whilst there will always be parents, such as myself, 
with greater cultural and economic capital to provide options for their children, it is not the government's job to fund this structural advantage. To quote Connors and McMorrow, the role of governments in schooling should be to mediate divergent interests and aspirations in ways that minimise social conflict and that allow schools to work effectively. Government have a particular responsibility to frame their policies in a way that protects and prioritises the interests of those students who are most reliant on them. I found Tom Greenwell and Chris Bonner's contribution today very interesting. They both argue for a choice and equity coalition, a funding model that funds every school, religious or secular, public or private, as long as they don't charge fees and don't have barriers to entry. Whatever the answer, I see the murmur of controversy, whatever the answer, we do need to build coalitions of support for a new funding system. We need to reach beyond traditional supporters of public education and we need to provide governments with political cover to do brave reform. And I like to think that this symposium is the beginning of that momentum once again, that we had at the beginning of Gonski and that we can maintain this time. It is possible, it is possible to do great reform. At heart, I am an optimist and a Democrat and I believe we will get there in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Verity. That was outstanding. Um, it reminded me when I was sitting there that in 2010, as a very new Green Director General in the ACT, in, in my first position at that level, I went to the, a ministerial meeting, my first one, and somehow or other, Andrew Barr, my minister, uh, wanted to sit near you. So I was between you both and your passion and commitment and just ability to, to carry the day during that meeting was something that was quite inspiring. But I was completely intimidated, so I love that I've met you tonight to actually talk to you, so it's fantastic. <laughs> okay, our final speaker and panellist for introduction tonight is uh, the Honourable Dr Carmen Lawrence AO. After training as a research psychologist at the University of Western Australia and lecturing in several Australian universities, Dr Lawrence entered politics in 1986, serving at both state and federal levels for 21 years. She was at various times a WA Minister for Education and Aboriginal Affairs and was the first woman Premier and Treasurer of a state government in Australia. Now I must stop here because I am a West Australian and I lived through that era. I didn't move out of Western Australia for another decade after that. And I remember at the time and certainly every year since, there's a lot of volatility in politics and leaders in particular don't treat each other well. And, and what I remember about you, Carmen, at that time was that you weren't one of those people. And it was probably the first time in Australia that, that we saw a leader uh, of, a, of, a, of a state or, or any leader across governance in Australia that was generous, proactive, uh, accountable and authentic. And they were really challenging times for you. Mm -hmm. And you managed to um, hold yourself in a way that um, I think Al Anthony Albanese is now taking up after, after that many years. So uh, it was, it was a, just amazing to watch you. Now I'll get back to the introduction. Shifting to, shifting to federal politics in 1994, Dr Lawrence was elected the, minister, uh, the member for Fremantle and was appointed Minister for Health and Human Services and Minister assisting the Prime Minister, Prime minister on the status of women. She has held various portfolios in opposition, including Indigenous Affairs, Environment, Industry and Innovation and was elected National President of the Labor Party in 2004. She is now a Senior Honorary Research Fellow and Professor Emerita in, in the School of Psycholo 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 Psychological Science, I'm overwhelmed now, <coughs> Psychological Science at the University of uh, Western Australia. Thank you for offering your expertise tonight on, to, on the proceedings and I look forward to hearing you speak. Thank you very much. On the time table, we've got about 10 minutes. You're right, just go for it. I'm going to push the question and answer session out a little. <clears throat> so thank you very much indeed, Jim, for the opportunity to talk to you today about what is essentially the education of our children and young people. That's why we're all here ultimately. A topic, I have to say, which has absorbed me for my entire adult life and probably some of my childhood as well when I think about it. I have a strong and continuing interest in education, fueled in part by my experience as minister that you've heard about in part my, by my career as a university lecturer, something I returned to after politics. And 
in part by the passionate, one might say even obsessional, involvement of many members of my family in education. I have nieces and nephews now coming through the system as well. I'm currently chairing, too, um, a panel to inquire into the state of public education in Western Australia for the State School Teachers Union. Mm. The government may or may not be interested in the findings. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and not surprisingly, systemic and funding issues such as those we've addressed today and you've heard about tonight um, and that we discussed in the Gonski panel still loom very large. Indeed, in my view, larger than ever. Seeing the consequences for our students and teachers of the failure of governments of both stripes and at both levels of government to seriously tackle the related structural problems of misallocated school funding and educational inequality has been very sobering when you see the effects on the ground and the effects on teachers. Just to take a step back and look at some, some I guess, broader issues in education. The twin propositions that more education is better and the more people who are educated, the better, better, appear largely uncontentious. There were certainly the assumptions that, if you look at it, were actually embedded in the Gonski Review, of which I was a member, and I'm sure the government <laughs> endorsed them as well. However, as we've discussed today, as I'm sure you've thought about, how better is defined is crucial. When you ask people why they think education's important, most, including a lot of educators and a lot of parents, point immediately to the personal instrumental value in ensuring a high paid and rewarding job and being part of that <laughs> cast. <laughs> After all, that's been the pro predominant public story for decades and shows little sign of being revised. You'll hear it all the time. And such thinking is almost certainly partly responsible for the push for greater choice in education and the shift of the children of the better off into the private system. Nationally, I think the benefits of a highly educated population for the health of the economy, but also get top billing in any discussion. So we look at the instrumental value for the economy. And such thinking appears to inform the contemporary discussion about economic growth and productivity. Education, especially skills-based education, is seen as something of a panacea. It's less certain, I'd have to say, that the contribution of education to individual creativity, health and well-being, or do wider social objectives like reducing prejudice, improving a democracy, would be mentioned at all, although they might be tossed in as an afterthought. You know, that's sort of the icing on the cake. <laughs> and God forbid that we should even hint at woolly ideas like the sheer glorious excitement of learning, <laughs> the delight of mastery, of bright curiosity satisfied, and of play for our very young students. <laughs> Even when these more expansive, less readily measured effects of a good education are mentioned, I have to say they often look like a cover for a tight focus on test results and school exit performance. A mandatory nod on the school website or the glossy prospectus and not really a test of worth. Yeah. It's instructive that when Australian education ministers meet, they routinely endorse these broader objectives although their policy choices don't appear to be much influenced by their lofty ideals, and we're about to see that happen again. The current declaration commits Australian governments to provide the opportunities for all young Australians, underline all, to reach their full potential, underline full, in three areas. Successful lifelong learners, confident and creative individuals, and informed members of the community. So say we all. Good objectives. I know there are many educators and parents who believe that in reality, the way we now think about education and measure achievement dismally fails to capture all these facets of young people's lives and that our measures of how we are doing in education are far too narrow. The restricted instrumental focus on vocational preparation and testing, in my view, is counterproductive, especially if it results in young people being denied the opportunities for genuine intellectual discovery and creativity which come with a less regimented approach. This may mark me as uh, old-fashioned, but I'm happy to wear that label. <laughs> Correspondingly, the nation may be starved of the ingenuity and creative problem-solving needed to respond to pressing social and economic problems if we're too nar narrowly focused on a narrow curriculum. A test-focused approach which substitutes for more careful evaluation of what our young people are experiencing undervalues those school experiences which are not obviously linked to performance on numeracy and literacy literacy tests. And it means that as a community we're likely to be blind too to the diverse needs and interests of children 
and to condemn many of them to a sense of frustration and failure. These observations, I hope, point directly to one of the shortcomings in any attempt to make comparisons based on a limited number of indices of children's and schools' performance. Much of what we value as a community may in fact be eliminated from consideration because of the tight focus on relatively easily measured uh, maths, science and literacy. I'm not saying those things are not important, mm. but it narrows our focus. If we're not attentive, especially if the rewards to students and teachers all flow from success on these tests, as very often they do, mm. these measures become proxies for educational worth, eliminating every other consideration in reality. A bit like using the GDP uh, and the growth in GDP as a proxy for our standard of living, and you know where that takes us. I'm aware that the uh, researchers at the Mitchell Institute have made a very valiant attempt fairly recently to overcome this short-sighted focus and broaden our assessment of educational outcomes and opportunity in Australia using as much published uh, data as they could get their hands on from all over the place, not just from education. They evaluated the current state of education from school, uh, entry to school to early adulthood with reference to those three main objectives I mentioned earlier that the ministers are signed up to. And the results of their inquiry are very disturbing indeed. While for many young people, our education systems appear to be working tolerably well, using all of those indicators about creativity and innovation and so on, as well as uh, test performance, one-fifth to one-third of children are lagging behind or missing out altogether on all of those indicators. And as the authors put it, they're not acquiring the lifelong learning skills and not mastering the knowledge and skills needed to become creative and confident individuals and active and informed citizens. That's an enormous proportion of our population. At each stage, large numbers are not reaching even modest benchmarks and they're more likely to be, as we've heard, from poorer families, living in rural and remote parts of Australia and to be Indigenous Australians. Large gaps based on socioeconomic status are exposed and uh, evident across nearly all the indicators from the earliest years right into early adulthood and indeed appear to increase over time. As the authors put it, the education system is mired in inequality still. Mm. Such gaps compound pre-existing inequalities. My own review of the literature on the effects of physical and social environments on children's well-being shows that many, many of our children already live in impoverished environments. Poor quality housing, greater noise and air pollution, higher crime rates, poorer cultural and community facilities, inadequate public transport, less green space, less parental income, and so on and so on. Most of the children who fail to thrive during their schooling come from these already very disadvantaged places. Mm. In my view, any decent public policy recommendations should begin with an attempt to place the current state of play in context, and thank you, Verity, <laughs> for doing that. And to ask first, how on earth did we get here? <laughs> Some of the influences, like increasing tolerance of inequality, are values driven and based in neoliberal economic policy. Some, such as shifts in parental expectations, appear to be more common in wealthy countries with smaller family sizes, not exclusively. Others, such as the growing gaps between funding government and non-government schools, are the result of deliberate policy choices. Let's not lose sight of that. These are deliberate policy choices over a great many years. Still others derive from an increasingly risk-averse and demanding bureaucracy, in part the result of the federal government meddling in schools, that's my very strong view, <laughs> and the role of certain political figures and the media can't be discounted. We've heard a bit about John Howard's contribution. <laughs> I just want to ask a couple of questions about the way we think about inequality, because I think it really does inform what we're prepared to do in schools policy. Mm. Egalitarianism, as you know, is frequently invoked as a quintessentially Australian virtue. It happens not to be, as a matter of fact, it's pretty <laughs> universal, but we, we like to claim it. Mm. It's routinely invoked as a founding principle of our democracy, and it has to be said, free, secular and compulsory public education has always been seen as one of its cornerstones. So ubiquitous is our public commitment to equality, I guess it's tempting to conclude that egalitarian values must be pretty deeply embedded in the structure of our institutions and public policies, mm. and evident in the status of our citizens. However, as you know, given the data indicating continuing group inequalities and the discrimination faced by significant numbers of Australians, egalitarianism may be better characterised, in my view, as a myth, functioning to provide comfort 
and to inspire us and offer moral, moral guidance rather than being rooted in fact. For instance, you would have seen, uh, I'm sure most of you, the Australian Institute's report from last week showing that the bottom 90% of Australians received just 7% of economic growth per mm -hmm. person since 2009, while the top 10% of income earners gained 93% of the benefits. Someone pointed out very carefully, this was before tax, as if that made it better. <laughs> <laughs> and that reverses the post-war trend, which saw the majority of benefits going the other way around. Mm. Now, it's not easy to determine precisely what Australian citizens mean when they commit to a fair go, or what form of egalitarianism they're signing up to. I have to say that in education, the policy settings and the funding arrangements signal either rampant privileging of the already privileged or a token form of egalitarianism. Mm -hmm. In endorsing the value of equality, some clearly intend little more than equality before the law. The goal being to ensure that the legal, regulatory and institutional framework doesn't impede Australians from competing on equal terms. Uh, people who um, look at this value endorse formal equality of opportunity, the equal treatment of all people regardless of circumstance. This typically encompasses measures to ensure discrimination based on characteristics like age, religion, gender, ethnicity, race, sexual preference are not officially condoned. So it's a very formal uh, notion. For such people, as long as the classroom doors open, the handicaps that some students bring with them are not seen worthy of policy attention. This position is often accompanied by the implicit assumption that success or failure is entirely the result of individual effort and merit, or lack of it. <laughs> You get what you deserve, and you deserve what you get. In psychology, you call it the just world hypothesis. I'm where I am because of you know, inherent virtue. <laughs> Significant inequality is tolerable because it's seen by some as an inevitable consequence of the unequal distribution of capacity. The steep mm. socioeconomic gradients that we've heard about are simply confirming evidence that those who are less well off, or belonging to one of these other groups, are simply living out their inherited an inherited, inherent state of inferiority. Mm. Now, it may seem tough to say that, but otherwise, why would we tolerate mm. these inequities? Mm. Conversely, those who I'm sure uh, are in this room who embrace substantive equality of opportunity, the need to achieve more equitable outcomes as well as equal opportunity, and take account of past discrimination, judge that all people should have the chance to develop their full potential, no matter what the circumstances of their birth. And this view of a fair go clearly requires a much more what I call muscular intervention by governments to remedy disadvantages that people face because of their early experience or because of the lack of wealth and status and power of their parents or social group. Mm. And that was certainly the agenda for the Gonski report. As President Lyndon Johnson explained, I love this quote, in a 1965 speech about the rationale for the equal opportunity programs rolled out during his administration. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bring him, up to, bring him up to the starting line of a race and then say, you're free to compete with the others and still believe that you have been completely fair. Or as he is alleged to have said more colloquially, and he often spoke that way apparently, to pull yourself up by the bootstraps, first you've got to have boots. <laughs> okay. International comparisons as we've heard also show that withdrawal of resources from the public to the private domain goes hand in hand with increased inequality in a society. Mm. It's one of the consequences. Mm. As James Galbraith has pointed out, inequality may cause the comfortable to disavow the needy, resulting in a two-tiered society, an apartheid economy, where those on higher incomes live lives which are fundamentally different mm. from the, the less well-off. People of affluence and people of modest means then lead increasingly separate lives Depending on our wealth, we live, work, shop, play in different places and send our children to different schools. Mm. In the past, our inclusive education system helped reduce inequality. Now, education, as we've heard and we've heard today as well, appears to be reinforcing privilege and making it even harder for the kids of poor Australians. The effects of income inequality are being amplified by our education policies. At the same time as inequality has risen in Australia, as I've pointed out, so has educational inequality. They feed off one another. Mm. It's no accident that the most unequal nations in the developed country league, as we've heard, have the poorest educational results, spend less on education, and have the most segregated educational systems. Mm. 
I sort of talked very briefly about Gonski because I'm uh, conscious of the time. Sure, Having on. been a member of that panel, we recognised the marked and increasing underperformance of children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And we understood that it wasn't going to be easy to remove some of the vested interests in the mm. system. We wanted to focus on the half a million or so students in the system at any one time who would go, were going to leave school lacking even minimal literacy and numeracy, mm. let alone some of those broader outcomes that I've talked about. The findings and recommendations of the Gonski panel, which you know, rightly had their critics, uh, nonetheless were based in good faith on mm. a capacity of the system to respond. It, these were unrealistic objectives that we set <coughs> the government and the governments of the day. It was a benchmark statement about what was going on. But since then, uh, and we've been, I think, rightly criticised, including by Greenwell and Bonner, on, squ on squibbing some of the hard structural mm. questions, we didn't even get the kind of incremental changes <laughs> that were necessary. So we certainly need to, to do better all around. I want to just very quickly then conclude on what I regard as one of the major contrib uh, contributors to this inequality in our system. Uh, as I say, there's the big broader question of inequality in our society which we're tolerating and which is reflected in our school systems. But one of the things that's uh, contributing is the way our education policy framework was set up in the first place. We've mm. heard a bit about that. And frankly, the problem is the most difficult to address. And that's the fact that the Commonwealth largely funds the private school system mm. and the states largely fund the state school, state school system. And there's been an increasing exercise of power by the Commonwealth over school policy more generally, which I think has generally not been a good idea. Someone mm. asked the question today, and mm. I haven't yet been able to get hold of the data. The introduction of NAPLAN and the decline in school performance in some <laughs> quarters have been correlated. There may not be a causal relationship, but I think a lot of those we heard today about the kind of the, the straighteners, a lot of the narrowing focus of education resulted from that focus on high stakes testing, which was driven largely out of the Commonwealth, it has to be said. Um, I'm not saying the states are uh, repositories of virtue, by the way, but mm. I think there's a capacity there uh, since they run schools and have to deal mm. every day with the people who, uh, whose children are in those schools mm. and, and whose communities are affected by them. They're likely to be somewhat more sensitive to some of these policy snafus than the federal government. And so I think that there is a task for us all to rethink not just the distribution of funds in an incremental way, which we're talking about today, I'm realistic about policy possibilities. Mm. I'm not stupid about politicians' willingness to take on some of these vested interests. But I do think as a community, we really need to look hard at the structure that we've, we've created mm. in Australia. The fact that we are outliers, mm. that inequality is continuing to grow, that performance even of the best of our students is falling off. And that's the thing about inequality. Everybody mm. suffers in yeah. unequal societies, whether it's education or health or whatever mm. it may be. And the split responsibilities for funding and the glaring inequities between government, state-funded and independent Commonwealth-funded schools has to be seen as fundamental uh, to that reform. I just will finally point out what I think is the, 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 if you like, the consequence of all of this. Such disparity in resources, as we've seen, will almost certainly lead to even greater inequities in performance. And as Bonner and Wilson have pointed out, largely because of the funding decisions by the national government, most non-government schools have become public, but without any of the responsibilities that attach to that status, and we've heard a bit about that. Mm. Despite the fact that government schools to date, because I think this is slipping, actually perform as well as private schools when initial disadvantage is taken into account, and some evidence that their students do better at university, by the way, mm. universities put their hands up on that one, uh, knowledge of these gaps in resources give further impetus to parents leaving the government school sector. Mm. So there are lots of stories around yeah. resources, around performance, some of which are not well based. But many of the schools that are performing better, uh, in inverted commas, do so by excluding. They mm. wash their hands of the difficult members of the um, school community, the ones with behavioural mental health problems, with difficulties in educational status. And that way, uh, they are able to maintain, if you like, a high standard. I think it's reasonable to insist, and we've already heard this to some extent, that no school should receive taxpayers' funds unless it's, unless it's prepared, first of all, to be fully accountable for those funds, to provide programs for all students, no matter what their ability, to allow students to choose whether or not to sit university entrance exams rather than being pushed off to the local high school, and to retain all students who are enrolled until the end of their schooling, developing appropriate programs for managing those with severe social and emotional problems.
it may be too late to follow the example of other countries, I hope not, mm. uh, who have more logical arrangements for funding. For example, Canada, we've heard about. But at least perhaps we can ensure that the national government's role should be on broad objectives and funding and leave performance to the states. Perhaps we can dare to hope that recognition of the inherent unfairness of our current system will eventually generate sufficient momentum to force change, mm. to hand the funding and responsibility for funding and oversight of all our schools to a single authority and then fund schools on an equal basis, taking account of that need that many of them have as they approach the school door. The entire nation's well-being is compromised when young people are not able to participate fully in education or when their schooling is narrow and unsatisfying. For the individual, the costs of a poor education are enormous. Mm. For the nation, the social costs of a divided society may be even greater. Education has a vital role in maintaining social, cultural and religious tolerance. Building mutual respect and tolerance toward others is critical and best achieved by close contact, rubbing shoulders with people you don't necessarily see every day in your life, not by occasional visits to exotic locations, which many of our private schools can afford. <laughs> our education systems should cultivate the ability of people to see themselves not just as members of some narrowly defined region, religion or group, but as human beings bound together to all other human beings by ties of recognition and concern. Such an ability has never been more needed than today. Thank you, Carmen. I'm oh, sorry for, the, for <laughs> delaying that. Uh, your thanks. It was just uh, passionate as always and committed, and um, we really value your voice and yours as well, Verity and, and Barry. Um, and the, the many people that were with us today, the 60 or 70 people that were in the room talking about all of these issues, um, it's refreshing and, and stra uh, stressful, I think, for, mm -hmm. for those of us that have been through the day to think <coughs> about the committed, um, highly intellectual people that are working to um, bring about outcomes for, for government schools and, and the public education, uh, while not forgetting uh, students in other, in, in other sectors. But, uh, but unless we do share that voice, and, and there were many points that were made to, uh, tonight that, uh, that reinforced that we do have to do this together, rubbing shoulders, I think, as mm. Carmen said, mm. uh, with each other, to make sure that our voice is heard and that we, there is some change. Because uh, in terms of the innovators and I think the problem solvers and the change makers who are currently in our school system, we need to be giving them everything that, that we can to make sure that they are going to change some of the issues that are impacting on our society uh, and our world at the moment. So can I thank you, Carmen, and uh, you, Verity, and you, Barry, for um, really giving us a, 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 an enchanting evening. It's just fantastic. <laughs> this is a, a very small gift that you might remember us by, but it's a, it's a Melbourne Graduate School of Education an Indigenous bag. So when you're carrying oh, around your books from now on, we'd like to see them carried in this. But again, another round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's very interesting.